pleased um, to have uh, Pacific Power as one of our presenting sponsors. And they have been a very good friend uh, of the chambers over the years and very um, supportive of uh, our summit. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Bill Clemens, who is a uh, regional manager here for Pacific Power. Uh, Bill is a good friend, former chair of the board of the chamber. And if you would please give a warm welcome to Bill Clemens. Thanks, Dave, and thanks to you and your staff for putting together such a great summit. Um, it's appreciated. Pacific Power is excited to be uh, part of the Walla Walla Business Summit. Uh, officially, we're in the power business, but part of that is also being in the business of community and economic development and being a partner with our, our local businesses here. Um, I'm very fortunate today to have the opportunity to introduce our next keynote speaker. We are fortunate to have Jared Hamilton, founder and CEO of Driving Sales in Salt Lake City, as our next keynote speaker. Jared is a successful entrepreneur, and he will give us insight into how the rapidly emerging digital tools are becoming a critical factor growing and succeeding in business. With that, let's please welcome Jared Hamilton. <laughs> hey, thanks everyone for the warm welcome. Super excited to be here. Um, one of the things that uh, they didn't mention is I'm also the partners. Um, my, my partner and I, Bill, recently purchased the Honda dealership here locally in town. So that's actually where the connection came with Dave and how uh, we, we came to become involved uh, with this business summit, which Dave, wherever you are, killer job putting this together. And Ken, um, from this morning with a cool Australian accent, I have a Californian accent, it doesn't really count for much, but uh, with a cool Australian accent, I loved his message and I'm actually gonna dovetail into it in quite a few different ways. Essentially, let me tell you what to expect over the next uh, you know, uh, 45, minute, 45 minutes or so. Um, my objective is to focus on the blending or the collision, depending on how you look at it, of the traditional world and the digital world, and how we as business leaders, mostly in the traditional world capacities, have to adapt and change to these digital world realities. So as you know, there's, there's this blending and this mesh of culture of technology, of various processes and opportunities. And it creates opportunities and it creates problems. One thing that I would remind you is that, of course, as an entrepreneur, every problem that we face is, in fact, an opportunity. That's how we create value as, as, as entrepreneurs. As, as an entrepreneur myself, I look for the biggest, gnarliest, heaviest problems that I can solve in the biggest marketplaces because I know that's where I can create the most value. And so I may reference from time to time problems. And when I'm talking about problems, please keep in mind that I have an entrepreneur lens on, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I get excited when I see problems, and we all should in our job as leaders. I'm going to tell you guys some stories. We'll weave in and out. I'm going to need some audience participation in a few things. Uh, we're going to do some case studies, and then we're going to end up with kind of five core takeaways that I think that any business leader should should use and to think about to adapt their team, their business, their company, whatever position you're in, to these digital worlds. Essentially, I want to give us a really clean framework about how to, how to uh, manage the implementation of all of this digital opportunity that, that comes at us, sometimes at, at Mach 10. Just out of curiosity, show of hands, do I have any hardcore software engineers in the room? No? How about an, any SEO engineers? How about any UX engineers? Like, what the heck's a UX engineer? I'm like raising my hand on that one. That's cool. Okay, no worries. Awesome. This is perfect because my message is not for them. So I'm actually pretty stoked that none of their hands. What I was going to go tell them, you guys go get some coffee. I'll see you in about 45 minutes. My message is for the the, the traditional business managers, non-engineers. I think a lot of times we look at the technology world and we get sort of twitter pated with like Twitter or with Facebook or with Google algorithms and Facebook edge rank and how is the web taking over and we hear that Facebook's buying Instagram. Oh no, but it's okay, we should be focused on Pinterest, but wait a minute, what's happening with Waze? We, these technologies, these brands, these companies that are being built and worth billions of dollars and we're just like, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, 
I don't get it. I don't write code. You want to know a dirty little secret that a lot of people don't realize? I'm, a lot of people look at me as a technologist. I'm very, very comfortable with technology. I don't write code. I kind of I do some math, admittedly. I write a lot of our algorithms. But I don't write the code. I pass it over to the engineers. This is very much meant to be how do traditional managers blend and take that digital stuff and put it into place. So one thing, oh yeah, a warning. I almost forgot. <laughs> If you haven't noticed, I talk really fast. I'm not a professional speaker, okay? I'm a, I'm a total entrepreneur. I, I speak really fast about this stuff. It isn't because I get nervous in front of groups because I fly a lot and I do this type of thing almost incessantly. My, I have five kids and my wife, uh, I, I, poor thing, I probably drive her nuts because I am on the road almost nonstop. I really enjoy being in front of groups and working with business owners, but um, I get really passionate about this. I'm really passionate about being an entrepreneur and I'm really passionate about technology. So you put those things together and it's like party and then I get going really fast. So anyways, um, if you have a aspirin or Excedrin, um, take it now <laughs> so it gets in your system so I don't give you a headache. And also coffee, Coke, Pepsi is really good right now because get the caffeine levels up so we can like maintain the same pace, got it? So. Um, that being said, let me tell you guys a little bit about who I am. The driving sales, this company that I created, so you're like, who's this entrepreneur, what does he do, and, and what's his background? What makes him qualified, other than the fact that he has red hair and talks really fast, to give us this message? So um, the, the business that I built, most people know it inside the auto industry, not really known outside the auto industry, like, why would you know it unless you own a car dealership, is um, we, I built the largest automotive social network in the world. So we have a user in like nine different countries, so, nine, so we're kind of global, and to give you an idea of like scope, about two thirds of all of the dealerships in the North American continent use our technology in some way, shape, or form. Um, the, the way that this thing got about, I did not see like, oh, Mark Zuckerberg built a social network, that's cool, we should have one in the auto industry. It's not the way that it worked at all. See, I was, I was buying real estate when I was in my early 20s, and I would fix up the houses um, on nights and weekends, and that's I, my whole life I wanted to be in the car business. And so, um, I, that's how I was gaining capital and my, my plan as a crazy entrepreneur, my plan was to leverage myself to the hilt and try and buy a dealership. So I put myself through the school that helped you prep to buy stores and then all of my classmates and I were in this class and we were all, I'd be facing a problem in Silicon Valley because that's where my, that's where I grew up and hence the tech focus and um, I'd be facing a problem at our dealership and my buddy in like, you know, Texas, he had already solved that problem because we were similar businesses. So I could just network and get the ideas, kind of like this kind of a setting. But he'd be facing problems in Texas and our friend in like Boston, well, she had already solved the same problems too. So I was like, wait a minute, if we could just network. So I came up with this idea. We had this homework assignment to show how a computer could better like help you run your dealership. And my classmates were like, here's an Excel spreadsheet to calculate frozen capital, how much old parts you got tied up in your parts farm. And one, like the most sophisticated one was, well, next to mine. What the most sophisticated one was the, like an, access, an, an access database that was like, you know, how to calculate, how to calculate this person's compensation or commission or something. And I was like, I built, I envisioned a program where I could make a profile for each of my classmates. And I built this profile and we could put information in that would get to know us. And then we could share data into a system. And then algorithmically, I could rate, route the data in between my classmates and I in real time. And then I, I could facilitate the networking. So it's, again, it's kind of like Facebook, social network. And some of you are like, whoa, that's cool. This guy created a social network before Mark Zuckerberg. That's really smart. And I'm thinking, freak, man, that guy's worth like $100 billion. I missed the boat. <laughs> you know? So anyways, I, that's how this thing, today our business has grown. And we have a media business. So we own a, um, you know, we own a news outlet. We own a magazine. I own a bunch of big trade shows in the auto industry. That's one way we deliver insight. Then, then I own an online university. It's the biggest online university now in the auto industry. We train. Um, thousands and thousands of, of professionals around on everything like um, how to answer the phone right, how to do SEO and technical stuff. And then um, we have a data and analytics division where I built this really big nerdy database and we pull analytics from all these different sources and we run these reverse real time regression analysis. Anyways, I'm going to lose it. Woo. This guy's an office rocker. Anyways, that's the kind of stuff that we do. So, um, uh, any, but, but, but what's more important, I think relevant here, is that my whole life, all I wanted to do is own a dealership. I can remember in third grade, third grade. Um, so the reason that's important is because it's a non-technical business. Again, I'm not an engineer. So in third grade, I can remember my teacher, like beginning of school, beginning of the year, and she's like, what do you guys want to be when you grow up? And my buddy, Matt, He's a fireman today, and in third grade, he was like, I'm gonna be a fireman. That's what I wanna do, I wanna fight fires. She's like, that's super noble. That's awesome, be a fireman. She's like, what do you wanna be? And Daryl was like, I'm gonna be a policeman. And today, my buddy Daryl, he's a policeman. And she's like, that's super noble, you're serving the community. And she's like, what are you gonna do, Jared? And I'm like, I'm gonna sell cars. And she's like, oh crap, call the nurse, the redhead, the one that looks like a leprechaun. He's in, that guy's nuts, right? But that's all I wanted to do when I was growing up. So. Um, Anyways, I, I, I grew up in the business. I, I built this other tech company. It's kind of grown, and now it's, you know, it's kind of cool and does its thing. And, 
And, uh, and then this opportunity came up with my partner, Bill, to, to, to invest here in the community and come get involved in Walla Walla and, and turn this Honda store around. And you'll see, I'm going to apply some of the lessons that I'm going to talk to you about, the learnings that I had in the tech company. I'm going to show you guys how we're trying to apply them in real life to this dealership, because I think it's good to have context about seeing how we can put this type of stuff in place. Um, but one of the first things that I did as, as we launched our company is I started investing in research because I, I just wanted to, that was like my insurance policy to make sure that we were thinking ahead of the curve. And the first study that I ever uh, invested in, I think is highly relevant to any business. We've used the output from this study to help attorneys, to help, um, I'm going to talk about a landscaper today. We've used it to help uh, dentists. We've used it to help other car dealerships. It's essentially a framework for how to think about digital the digital world inside of traditional businesses. So what I did was I took, I wanted to understand how dealership business models were changing. So I took uh, financial statements back to 1964. I went to the National Dealers Association. And then I went, uh, they gave me financial statements back to 64. And then um, I went to UC Berkeley. There was a professor that loves the auto industry. These students were doing like, they'd IPO their company like Google and they'd make millions of dollars. And like, what are you gonna do? Like, I'm gonna get my PhD and like teach. And I go, okay, cool. So, so then they go to the school and they get their PhD and he would study all of their work in the auto industry. So it was kind of relevant to us. And anyways, we did this, Big statistical analysis where I overlaid financial statements against broadband connectivity trends, and I want to see how business models change when consumers go online. And I want to see how non-traditional, non-digital businesses change when consumers go online. I want to see the movements in the financial statements. And, um, and, and it was really fascinating. It was really interesting to see how these businesses and whatnot are evolving and changing. And then what I wanted was some like, statistically proven way, like what's the right path, what's the right strategy. And the more that we dove into various businesses, um, the more we found that there were you know, thousands and thousands of different combinations that, that could work. So we needed some way of distilling this down into something that was like ultra, ultra simple. And that's where we came up with this model. We call it three pillar thinking. It's ultra simple, but it's really profound. So let me walk you through how to think about digital opportunities, problems that you guys face inside of no matter what kind of business you are. You could be at the local bank. You could be you know, running your dental office, you could be the local photographer. Every business in any vertical in any industry essentially can break your digital problems, not technology, but we're going to break our digital problems down into three operational categories. Again, this is the blending of how the digital affects the traditional. First, I want to talk about marketing, this pillar over here on the right. Most of the time when we think about marketing in the traditional sense, we go to TV, radio. TV, radio, paper, those things are good and they can connect us to the local community. But when digital comes around, there, there tended to be this fight because the digital guys needed share of wallets. So they started coming in with different metrics and they're like, those traditional guys are bad. The traditional guys are not bad. What's important is you have to understand what your outcome is. And, and I'm gonna get to that in a minute. But the bottom line is we get confused because most of us didn't grow up programming computers. So when we start thinking about digital marketing, we are educated by this person, like what Ken talked about, the sales pitch that comes our way. That's a lot of times how we business owners get educated on the opportunities. But you have to separate the agency or the, the vendor or that what is selling you the digital marketing solution from the actual principle of what makes the digital marketing solution work. So the way that I want you to look at this is understand that there are a lot of different digital channels. There might be lots of vendors that play within those channels, but the channels are about the discipline or what action you and your traditional business have to take to make that digital marketing work. Paid search, paying to get high on Google, is a totally different discipline than ranking your website organically in the search engines, right? Very different discipline. You're really good at paid search, really crappy at organic search. Same thing, optimizing a website for the proper conversion, whether you want phone calls, you want people to email your store, you want people to transact on the website, whether you're using like an eBay shopping cart or an Amazon shopping cart, all that stuff's sort of irrelevant. What matters is am I good at optimizing the website? And if you can identify these disciplines that exist in your vertical, there are 16 of these disciplines in the auto industry. Um, it's different in real estate. It's different in the dental industry based on the maturity and the life cycle of the marketing opportunities that you have. But the, what's key in all digital marketing, what's key in all digital marketing is that digital marketing is a particip participatory medium. This is a very stark contrast to what we face in the traditional marketing world, right? Think about how we buy radio. You're like, oh crap, I should have moved. Man, this guy, I'm gonna get picked on two speakers in a row. Sorry, man. <laughs> but think about how we buy traditional media. This is what I used to do at the dealership, right? When it was just traditional, is we would forecast our year, we'd figure out 
based on the winter months versus the summer months because you tend to sell more in the summer because people stay inside more in the winter. I don't know why, it just is, right? And so we'd forecast and we'd figure out how much we want to spend on marketing and it gets bigger certain months and smaller and we'd come up with our forecast and then we'd call and we'd say, I need to invest in the marketing and they'd say, well, we, you need to, to get your appropriate mind share, you know, to get awareness. You need to have this type of reach and this type of frequency to out be louder than your competitors or whatever. And you'd come up and then you'd negotiate your spend and then they go do the buys with the various radio stations. And it's probably about November, December timeframe because you're trying to do it a year in advance because you get a better buy if you can buy it a full year in advance. So you do a big gnarly commitment. Here's the million dollars you guys are going to get. We're going to spend with you over the next year, big months, small months, et cetera. And you make the decision and your ad agency comes in as a creative and you make the decision to set it and forget it, man. At that point in time, you've made the buy, you've made the spend. It's just time for you to come show me the reports once a month, once a quarter. We go to a couple ball games, you know, buy a beer, have some pizza. Life's good, right? Digital marketing, not at all that way. Digital marketing is a lot more like poker, meaning when you pay the ante, that's when the game begins. Okay? Digital mar traditional marketing, you do a lot of the work up front, and then you make the spend, and it does its thing. Digital marketing, you do all the same work up front. Once you make the spend, you have way more work to do. Very, very different when you compare them. But those of us that grew up in the traditional landscape, have, this is a new thing that we have to learn. Very important. Our return on investment in digital marketing is directly proportionate to our ability to execute upon it. Very, very important. If you can't execute on it, don't make the digital spend. Let me give you a classic example. Grab a pen or pencil if you've got one in front of you, and the first person to solve the problem wins 100 points. Ready, go. You guys are like, is this guy serious? Um, I'm going to talk about SEO for a minute. Who in here feels like they know how to do SEO, get a web page ranked in Google? Anybody? A couple of you? Right on. Okay. So I'm going to give you the ultra simple basics, just so that you guys can understand this concept what I'm talking about is of it being a participatory medium. When we think about SEO, we think about Google's algorithm, and that's pretty heavy. And admittedly, it is heavy. And nobody knows exactly what it is. We just know that there are several hundred, more than 200 signals that they use to determine which page to rank. Think about the process from a user perspective. I go to, I go to Google and I type in a word Taurus, search. Google has to figure out if me as the user is looking for Taurus, a bull, because I'm into bullfighting, or Taurus, my horoscope, because I was born in May, or Taurus, a car, because I'm into Fords, right? So Google's got to figure that out, and then they go back into their database and they say, okay, we have 75 million web pages that talk about Taurus, the bull, because this person's into bullfighting. And then they have to rank those pages by what's the most relevant to the user, second most relevant, third most relevant, and then they always put on their search results page, you know, something like 75 million search results rendered in 0 .04 seconds. And that part's not critically important, it's just Google bragging how fast their servers are. So that's what's going on from a Google standpoint. What happens from a business standpoint? What do we do? Because if we can get more search visibility, Arguably, we get more traffic, we get more traffic, we have more opportunity to do business, more opportunity to do business equals more sales, sales tends to equal net profit, net profit equals vacations, and the world goes round, right? So rankings equals vacations. I want some more of that. So how do I get it done? Three simple steps, every single business, it's the same thing. Step number one is getting the web page indexed. Again, this isn't meant to be training on like the nitty gritty of SEO, this is to illustrate the point. So I'm gonna go like lightweight here. But it's getting a web page index. How do you get a web page index? It's simple. You follow the rules of Google lined up. They have them in their webmaster tools. You build a site map. It's basically a, a chart, a chart. It's a map of your website. Hmm, like called a site map. Oh, fit, go figure. So a robot comes, the little Google bot. They actually changed the name of it recently, but we'll call it the Google bot for nostalgic sake. So the Google bot comes to the website and, and it looks at the home page and it says, this is the home page of the local dental, uh, the local dentist. And then there's links across the top. And what the Google bot does is it clicks the link and it goes to the, the um, cavity filling page. And there's a page about your cavity filling services or something. And then it takes a picture of that and it puts it in the database. And then it goes and says teeth whitening services. You can get teeth whitening services here. It takes a picture of that and it puts it in the database. And the Google bot goes and touches all of the links, memorizes all of the pages and puts it into the database. And this process of take a picture of it, put it in the database, is called getting indexed. If Google doesn't know your web page doesn't exist, what's the likelihood that you're going to show up when someone types in, I need to get teeth, my teeth whined in Walla Walla? You're not going to show up. Google doesn't know you exist. So step number one is getting indexed. You simply follow Google's rules, right? So you hire some nerd like me that knows how to do that, and they go, go to work, and they do it, okay? It's not very hard. Most web platforms today automatically get indexed in Google. So that's step one. Step two, <clears throat> Google um, struggles to understand language. 
They understand math really, really well, but they, they struggle to understand language, although with semantic web, they're getting much, much better at it. Um, but we'll put that aside for a moment. We have to tell them what the page is about. So we have to tell Google that this is about teeth whitening. And so, so some people would say, like, like you'll get someone that will come sell you SEO, and they're like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take, you have a white background on your website. I'm going to take the word teeth whitening, and I'm going to use a white font, and I'm going to copy and paste it 700 times at the bottom of the page. And you're, nobody, none of your customers will see it. It won't annoy them, but Google will see it. And then you'll rank high. <laughs> like, whatever, man. That's like so 1997, and it barely worked then. Point is, there's good SEO and there's bad SEO. That's an example of really bad SEO. What Google looks for is they study language and they want to see your website talking the way that humans want to respond. So we know that in the English language, particularly on this continent, I don't know about Australia, they, they speak kind of funny over there, right? But on a, in the United States, I'm kidding, Ken, is they, uh, about, if you're having a conversation about teeth whitening, then the word teeth whitening will come up linguistically about 5% of the time. You write for humans, provide value to your customers, and Google algorithmically is trying to figure out how, how the human, you know, whatever English language works, and they're mimicking the math to figure out if you're providing the right value. Point is, step two is about talking on page, putting the right text, the alt tags, Google gives us guidelines, to make sure that they know that page is about teeth whitening. First step, they know it exists. Second step, now they know what it's about. Third step is, how do you get that to rank higher than everything else? Because now you're just included in the one of 75 million search results for, for teeth whitening. And so what Google does, they look for outside signals. The most common outside signal, arguably one of the strongest, and it's constantly changing, are the links that point to the website. This is called link building. The concept is very simple. If I were to bring you all into a room and say, um, here's a 10 NBA basketball players, um, Vote, who's the best player? And you, and you can all point, and I can count how many people are pointing to Larry Bird versus Michael Jordan versus Magic Johnson. And I could say that the Walla Walla um, business owners think that Larry Bird is the best. And the more pointing to Larry Bird equals votes, and I can see you guys think Larry Bird is But then I would say, wait a minute, you guys are Walla Walla business owners. You're probably not as good at this basketball thing as a bunch of basketball players. So let's bring in the NBA All-Star team. Let's put them in here. Here's a whole bunch of top 10 players that have played over the last several decades. Who's the best? You guys know basketball now. And I have the NBA All-Star team point, and they might say it's Michael Jordan, right? And then, so basically what we're doing is we're using wisdom of the crowd to figure out where authority should go. Google does the same sort of thing. So Google looks at links pointing to a website, and the more off-page signals that point to a particular website, the more it's valued. So for example, let's say that I was going to write a blog post on my dealership blog about a local dentist, and I were to say, hey, um, Dr. Jensen just bought a Honda Pilot from us. He seemed like a pretty cool guy. In fact, he does teeth whitening. If you guys are interested in his teeth whitening, you could look at it here. And I could take the word teeth whitening and I could point it to his website. In very, very simplistic terms, Google looks and says, hey, there's this one website that's independent pointing to another one for the word teeth whitening. That means this website that is receiving the link must have something good to say about teeth whitening because I wouldn't want my users of my website to have a bad experience, so I wouldn't link them to somebody else with that keyword unless I had confidence that they were gonna find good teeth whitening information there. Make sense? So that is a very simplistic fashion is what Google does, they count inbound links. Now, there's over 200 signals, this is one of them, and you can argue, those of you that know about SEO, Link building is definitely changing in its value. But the point is this, if you understand this, you realize now that there are three steps to get anything ranked in Google. One, getting my site indexed so the Google bot knows how to crawl it and take the pictures so it exists. Two is telling the Google bot what my page is about, writing the appropriate context on the website. And three, getting the local community and the local community online to react positively to send positive signals to Google about my content. You do those three things, Google knows you exist, they know what you're about, and that de determines your authority. You put those three things together and you can pretty much rank for any keyword, right? I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you game Google. I'm, I'm not suggesting that you fake the system. What I'm suggesting is, is two things. One, if you understand this, if you go to your computer, this is a super old, like, so we always do when we train SEO, type in the word click here. I mean, you don't really need to do this, I'm just gonna walk you through this. If you type in click here into Google, what comes up? What should be like the top five links? Maybe like clickers, click here or something, or those cat trainer things, click, 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 so you get the cats, you know? Um, but typically in the top three links is always Adobe. Why would Adobe Acrobat come up in the top three links for the word click here? It doesn't make any sense at all. It does when you understand the math of what's going on behind the scenes, 
There's a bazillion web pages. The most common way to share a document online is what? PDF. What do you need to read a PDF? Adobe Acrobat. So I might say, I'm the Walla Walla Chamber of Commerce. Here's a PDF of the schedule of events at the Walla Walla Valley Business Summit. It's in a PDF format. You need Adobe Acrobat to read it. Don't worry, it's free. Click here to get it. And there are bazillions of links around the web that point to Adobe that say click here. And Google thinks click here equals Adobe. Make sense? So now all of a sudden you're like, ah, I'm as smart as Google engineers. Keep in mind that's only one of like 200 links and they do some really crazy stuff. Point, takeaway from us as a business perspective is this. Someone knocks on our door and says, I need to sell you SEO. Cool. What are you going to do to make that SEO work? And what exactly are they selling you? SEO is then a service. Because you can spend all the money you want if someone's not getting your web page indexed, writing copy on your website to make sure that Google knows what it's about, and doing the things off page in the community, the social media shares, the likes, the tweets, the Facebooks, the inbound links, et cetera. Your web page isn't going to rank. Don't spend the money. It's a participatory medium. Make sense? Now, this is just marketing. I've only started tackling one thing. Too often times I see businesses spend in digital marketing and then it fails. And then the business owner says that digital marketing stuff is just a waste of time. It's all, you know, wizardry magic, the Wizard of Oz, and I don't get it. I wish Al Gore would plug that dang thing, right? Well, that's because that's only one of three pillars. And I said at the beginning, you have to get operationally good at all three and you have to do them in the right order. The second pillar is process. Your business is made up of a variety of processes. Consumer behavior is changing. Ken talked about this. We are in the business of providing exceptional consumer experiences, but consumers' expectations are changing so dramatically today because of, of the way that the internet is teaching us how to shop, right? You see it in all sorts of businesses. I'll just give you a classic example. Just three days ago, I'm, tr I'm trying to get my backyard re-landscaped. Right now, I got online and house. If any of you guys don't know what that is, it's sort of a social network of, yeah, it's a social network for basically home remodels. It's freaking awesome. We just remodeled our entire house last year, gutted it down to the studs. I redid the whole thing based on house. It was so cool. So I go in there and now it's time for the backyard. So I went and found a bunch of good landscapers and whatnot in Salt Lake. I live up in Sandy by the ski resorts. And I found a couple of landscapers on house. And I, they did some killer work. I was looking at their pools. And I, I want to do a pool, and then I want it like covered. And I want walls that are around it. And then I want to be able to move the walls. So I'm kind of a specific thing. I'm, I'm young, and I have red hair, and I'm pale skin, And I've already had skin cancer once. I don't want to deal with it again. So my thing is, I want a pool, but I don't ever want to wear a sunblock. So I'm trying to find somebody that can build this for me. I find it on house, two companies, right? They've done good at marketing. So I got online, I was flying, and it says, send them a message. So I send them a message on house. I landed in Las Vegas two days ago for another meeting that I had kind of like this. And guess what? I had a text from one of the guys. It's now been three, almost four days. The second person hasn't even responded. And what are they going to do? They're going to have a meeting with their digital agency, the person that told them, you need to get on house, spend the money, buy the ads. They're doing all the stuff right. They captured the customer. Where's the breakdown? Has nothing to do with digital. Has everything to do with their store process. They don't have a CRM system. Someone didn't get the lead. Someone got the lead and forgot it. There's no management follow-up. But it's a process breakdown, and you're not seeing digital return on the investment. Too often times in today's age, we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater and we're saying that digital crap's not working. And the reason that it's not working is because there's a traditional process breakdown. Today, customers want information. We want it now. We want it fast, right? So think about credit card processing. It drives me insane when I find a taxi cab, when I can't, when I can't find a taxi cab that won't let me swipe a credit card. Let alone today, I just use Uber on my mobile phone. Customers are going to find better ways of engaging with our business. And if we don't put our, ourselves in front of the customer's path from a process standpoint, we will just simply lose the business. We can't expect the customers to stay in the dark ages because we don't want to adapt, right? Uber's coming, whether we like it or not. You may love Uber, you may hate Uber. The world is saying they dig Uber, right? Uber's coming whether we like it or not. If I was a taxi driver today, I'd be figuring out how to get on Uber, not how to fight the system, right? It's just the way that it is. Consumer experience is like gravity. There's a natural pull to it. Our job is to put ourselves in front of it from a process perspective. Then the third one is structure. This is a part where I want a lot of your engagement. I'm going to ask you all a question here. Structure, when I talk about structure, I talk about really the foundation of the business, the org chart, the pay plans, the employees that we're hiring, the skills that they have. Classic example, 
How many of you guys want to rank on Google? Raise your hands. How many of you, if you want to rank really good on Google? Most hands go up, okay? All of you should have raised your hands. The rest of you are probably just saying, this crazy redhead talks too fast. We all want to rank on Google. How many of you now in your business employ somebody, a professional writer, a journalist, to manage your, your content for you? How many of you? Go ahead, raise your hands. There should be a few. Very few hands go up, a few of you. How are you going to get yourself to rank on Google if you don't have the professional writing skills? Is it Google's fault? It's a structure problem. We don't have the right org chart, the right job roles, the right pay plans, the right skills on our team. How if you don't have a professional journalist, you're like, I'm a dentist, but cool, find a kid at the local university, go down and hire him and pay him, you know, whatever the hourly rate is to get them to write content for you part time. But how are you going to do good in channel of SEO or in channel social media marketing or in channel writing copy for AdWords keywords if you don't have a, a well-equipped writer at your disposal? I'll give you a hint. You won't be competitive. And if you're not going to be competitive, don't spend the money on the digital world. Uh, and don't blame it on the marketing opportunity. That is a structure problem. Make sense? So let's pause on this real quick and let's do this case study. Two years ago, last September, the big, huge company Blockbuster, multi-billion dollar movie rental place, sadly filed bankruptcy. Gone, dunzo. Why did Blockbuster file bankruptcy? Netflix. Netflix, great answer. What else? Just you can yell it out. We'll get rowdy. Rowdy and Walla Walla. Yell out the answers. Redbox, Redbox, Netflix. Okay, so what did Redbox or Netflix do that Blockbuster didn't? Adapted. How do they adapt? I don't know who said that. In the back? That is an awesome answer, 100 points. You should be a politician. That is beautiful. Because it is absolutely right, but it doesn't tell me anything. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> what did they not adapt to? Because you're right, they didn't adapt, but what? Customers want. Customers How so? Delivery channel. So was it distribution? They want it now. Distribution, convenience. Let me push back on both of these. I love that you guys are thinking, but I'm, I'm here to stimulate thought. So don't let me finish. I'm going to push back. Distribution. Getting it to the customers. Who had better distribution, Netflix or Blockbuster? Who had bigger distribution? Who touched the more customers? Blockbuster. Blockbuster had them beat on distribution long before Netflix was even born. Now, you can make that there was a, a strategic advantage to Netflix distribution, but clearly Blockbuster had won. And if Blockbuster wanted to have converted all of their customers to a better distribution medium, they could have, right? It wasn't distribution that killed Blockbuster. They had, even when they filed bankruptcy, even the day that they filed their paperwork in the bankruptcy court, Blockbuster had more customers than Netflix did wasn't distribution that killed them. It wasn't distribution. Someone said convenience. Someone said convenience. Does convenience alone kill a business? I mean, we can argue that it hurts a business. Oh, my leg is it's hurting. But it doesn't like drive a stake through their heart. How many of you guys have been on an airplane and flown Delta, United? <laughs> Need I say anything more? We have all do business with multi-billion dollar companies that are absolutely inconvenient to work with, right? <sighs> you know what I'm talking about. So, so convenience, while it may hurt or slow us down, convenience alone typically doesn't drive a stake through the vampire's heart. Overhead. overhead. Talk to me about overhead. What do you mean by that? Um, you're on the right path. I love where you're going with this. The cost to deliver the product, okay? We are, now we're on a good path. Let, let's dissect this a little bit. It isn't just overhead that did it, although overhead was a piece of it because Blockbuster was a very healthy multi-billion dollar company for years. So they had figured out how to manage their overhead versus their revenues appropriately, right? What changed? What did Netflix do and Blockbuster didn't adapt specifically? Late fees. Late fees. We're starting to hit it. B 
business model. Someone define a business model for me. A business model is the way that we make money. A business model is the way that we make money, okay? The way that we take value out of the value chain. Now, question for you all, what industry are we talking about here? We're talking about the entertainment industry. Let's do a three minute analysis of various business models in the industry. So we can make sure that we're clear on what a business model is because this is super important. Super important to the point. Where do movies start? What's that? Long before that, who writes them? Screenwriters do. And what is the business model of a screenwriter? Screenwriters, they come up with their creative people, right? And they're gonna go fly out to Martha's Vineyard and they're gonna spend like a month there. And they hold them some up with a Martha's Vineyard with a bunch of wine and they some weed and woo. And then they write their story. And you're like, they're the creative people. And what's their business model? They trade that time for money and they take their scripts and they go sell it. Time for money, that's what a screenwriter does. They may take a small percentage of the overall pie, but, but usually it's so small. It's, they trade time for money. Who buys it? Who buys the scripts? The producers. What business model are the producers in? The producer's business model is they have a lot of cash. And they go and they buy the script. Thank you. And then they hire Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie and Michael Bay. And they're like, we're going to put together a movie. Here's $250 million. Go make this thing awesome. And we'll see it in a year. And then they buy the script and they invest a bunch of dough. Brad Pitt and Angelina. That's a big compliment. I just called you guys Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. And they, they go and make a movie. And how do they make their money back? What's their business model? Theaters. Ticket sales. Most of the ticket sale revenue goes right back to the producers. But wait a minute. If the producers are making money off of the ticket sales, how are the theaters making money? What's their business model? Popcorn. popcorn. They're in the popcorn business, right? It's like 20,000% markup. Like the margin on popcorn is insane, right? So you see these different business models down the ecosystem. So now it's out of theaters and it's going to come into home release. What was Blockbuster's business model forever? Transaction-based, late fees. $2.99 to rent the DVD for the weekend, and then you can charge, I'll charge you $12 for late fees. That was the blockbuster business model. What was Netflix business model? Subscription. It's like 10 bucks a month. You get three DVDs, hold them as long as you want. The key here is that Netflix invented a new business model, and then the next thing is that Blockbuster had, had an old business model. Does that alone kill a company? Pause right there. Did the business model kill Blockbuster? No. No, it didn't. We have to continue with the story. So Netflix comes out with a new business model. Blockbuster, did you guys know, had an opportunity to buy Netflix? And they said no. Do you guys know why they said no? $40 million. They could have bought Netflix for $40 million. The board considered it. The board hired an internal team to go study whether this was a good transaction to make. What was the recommendation to the board? Word for word, these were the words that they used. They said, we don't believe that Netflix is a viable opportunity. Why? Because our customers enjoy, this is a joke, because our customers enjoy the serendipitous nature of running into their neighbors at the local Blockbuster location. No joke, that was the report that came back. And they said, no thanks, we're not gonna buy it for $40 million dumbest business move ever. It's, it's, that's like as bad as the dude that walked away from his Apple stock when he was like 10% for like $700. Poor guy. Anyways, bad move. So what killed Blockbuster? Blockbuster then decided, we have distribution. We're going to compete with them. They came up with a subscription service. Yeah? They came up with a subscription service and they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Netflix. My wife subscribed to both of them. Why? I have no idea, but some things you don't question when you travel as much as I do. You're just like, yes, honey, whatever you want, right? Same product. So then what killed Blockbuster? It was after the business model switch, Blockbuster was faced with a choice. And essentially the choice was continue as you are or amputate your legs. When the business model changed, the expense structure became out of line. 
but it didn't come out of line until after the business. Blockbuster was fine as long as they were in the physical rental business. They might have scaled up, they might have scaled down, but as soon as they went to streaming, the whole business and margins and metrics that they run the business fundamentally changed. And they didn't want to, the CEO didn't have a strong enough gut to amputate the company's legs and to tell Wall Street that we're gonna have to close a bunch of retail locations, sell off a bunch of real estate that we have lots of equity in, cancel the leases so that we can reduce our liabilities and we're gonna to have to lay off some people. That sucks, I'm not saying that that's a good, healthy decision, but I'm saying instead what they traded was the entire company died. That's why Blockbuster didn't survive. It all came down to their business model changed and they didn't want to adapt their structure. And your structure of your business, traditional business, Retail, online, doesn't matter. The structure of any business has to be inseparably connected with your business model. Why do I bring this up? I bring this up because in a lot of cases, our traditional business models are changing due to the pressures of the web. And we are gonna be faced, are today faced, and will face some of the toughest challenges that we have, will have in our entire careers as businesses because you may be faced with amputating a leg. That is hard, gnarly stuff. I'm not pretending there's an easy solution. My job today was to come in and talk to you guys about how traditional businesses can compete in this digital world. And it comes down to three things. Number one, getting good at that marketing that we talked about. Number two, aligning your processes for the customer experience, like what Ken was talking about. And number three, it's making sure that our structure that underpins our business adapts so that the business model is solid. I said you have to do all three. If you do one or two, you will grow and then plateau, period, end of story. The only way to continue to grow is you have to do all three. I also mentioned there was a right order to do them in. I did not present them to you in the appropriate order. What is the right order that is traditional businesses we should tackle these in? You start with exactly what Ken was talking about. It is all about the consumer experience building trust and making sure that we are maintaining our relationships with our customers. When all else fails, anytime we have a business challenge, we go right back to our relationship with our customer, always, period, end of story. Because in the end, Ken said it best, we are in the money business and consumers vote with their wallets. We have to take care of our customers above all else. Start with the processes, make sure that they map. Think of the landscaper that hasn't replied. He's missing out on a six-figure job to redo my house because he doesn't have a process in place. Not only did he just miss six figures worth of revenue, but what? He's wasting a bunch of marketing money. He's spending money that he doesn't need and he's getting and losing revenue that he could have had. It's like a one-two punch of not goodness, right? <laughs> so cut that one. <laughs> he should have started with process. Start with process, then you'll realize that, wait a minute, to make this thing scalable, I'm gonna have to reinvent my structure. Sometimes that reinvention of the structure is little, sometimes the reinvention of the structure is big. Once you've got the processes nailed and you're thinking about the scalability of the structure, only after those two things are done is it time to go focus on the Facebooks and the Googles and the Instagrams and the cool shiny objects of the world. But the marketers tend to knock on our door and they sell us and they bring, we're like squirrels, shiny objects. And we're like, yeah, right? Don't focus on that stuff. Like, look away from the light. Look away from the light, folks, right? Focus on process, then get to structure, then you'll get to marketing. I told you there was gonna be five takeaways. These are them. I'm gonna talk to you about how we're doing this at the Honda store, because this is real life. Like, we're going through this right now. First thing is know yourself. This is an expansion of what Ken said. When I say know yourself, I think you as an organization need to be ultra clear like Ken is talking about on what your brand is. You have to be so clear on what your brand is that you know that you can tell me who you do not want to do business with. <gasps> I just said the dirty word. But think about it. How many of you raise your hand if you own an Apple product? Okay, most of you. How many of you raise your hand if you bought that Apple product because it was the cheapest phone on the market? or the cheapest laptop, or the cheapest MP3 player. Go ahead, raise your hands, be proud. Bueller, <laughs> Bueller, anybody? No, you didn't buy the Apple product because it was the cheapest on the market. Why? Because Apple isn't anywhere near the cheapest on the market. Why? Because Steve Jobs decided long ago that Apple wasn't in the business of selling to mooches. If you want to be a mooch, cool, call Dell. That was his business plan, right? He understood his model. And if you look at the financial statements of Dell versus Apple, look at the margins of the product, dramatically different. You want to know the irony of the situation? Where do they buy their processors? 
Same company. <laughs> Who puts the product together at the factories in China? Same factory. They're just different business models Im implemented on the same platform. I'm not saying that there isn't a difference between Apple and Dell. I'm a big, huge Apple fan. They had this a Windows machine, and I was like, holy cow, how do you use this? I haven't used one of these things in forever. So, but my point is that Apple decided what they were, and they played everything to it. Think about Ken's experience at, the lo at, at a local dealership, right? Think about it. I love it. And it was kind of cool as a dealer for him to be like ripping on dealers because I love it because that's exactly what I want because our whole thing is we're trying to build a different kind of a business. So look at our mission statement, okay? You guys can, you guys can tear it apart in your local businesses. You guys can put us to the test. You can tell me when our guys are failing. Our mission is to provide an experience so awesome now, so awesome that our guests recommend us to all their friends and are returning again and again for all their automotive needs. Let me dissect this. These aren't just words on a wall. This has meaning. And let me show you how we're acting to implement it, right? Because this is what I'm talking about is knowing your business model and trying to say sometimes n no to good things. That's the challenge today is you sometimes have to say no to good things. First off, to provide an experience so awesome. What does awesome mean? Awesome means freaking rad. Where did that come from? That came from me, because I grew up surfing in Northern California. Some people are like, Jared, you say like stoked too much. It makes you sound unintelligent. I'm like, I say, dude, dude, are you gonna hold that against me? Like, give me a break, it's just who I am. It's authentic, it's authentic and it's who we are. It's rare that I wear dress shoes. Most of my shoes, I always wear the same Adidas. They have my name on them right there. Why? Because I think they're cool, that's who, they, that's who I am. Right? And you see the personality seep through in the brand. Second thing, our guests. We don't believe that they're just customers. We believe that when you come to the, our dealership, it's like you need to be treated like you're our guest in our home. Our objective is to get a recommendation. It isn't to get a sale. I care more that someone that comes to our dealership and leaves, Bill and I are my partner, we care more that when you come to our dealership and leave, it is more important that you would tell your family, your family or your friends that that looks like a good place to do business. That is more important to us than it is to sell the most. If you look at most dealerships advertising, what does it say? Number one sales leader in the market, lowest prices. We give everybody a great deal. The, uh, the irony of this is, in order for us to get to that, obviously we have to give a good deal. But who here likes to negotiate for a car? Yeah, nobody. Guess what? Us either. So we just say this is simple. You know you're not going to pay retail. We know you're not going to pay retail. We'll just give you the best price we can right up front. Let's just get away with all that negotiation garbage. Why? So our peers, we go to these meetings, Bill and I, and they're like, you're nuts. You're giving away your cars way too cheap. And we're like, yeah, we are. That's because our business model isn't about most sales with the highest dollars today. Our business model is recommended and returning again and again. Our salespeople aren't paid commission. Why? Because paying someone on a commission drives them to do what? Get the sale that day. I want them to provide an experience that you'd recommend us, not get the sale that day. I don't care if you buy today. I don't care if you buy tomorrow. I care that you enjoy your experience so much you tell somebody else to come down. It's a different model. Our pay plans are designed to it. We, do we hire people from inside the auto industry? We try and avoid it. No offense to anybody else in the room that's in the car business, okay? I mean, I grew up in it, but the point is this. We know who we are and we're developing a different type of an experience. And, and it isn't just a plaque on the wall. It has to be intertwined in who you hire, why you hire, the skill sets that you screen for, and how you compensate your people. Everything has to come through in this mission statement. That's how you know that you believe it, right? That's how you know that you believe it, and that's how you drive towards a different experience. Second, once you've got that know who you are, you have the process. Start with handling your customers the right way. And you say, well, I always know how to handle my customers because I've been in business for 30 years. That's a dangerous position to be in. One of the things, admittedly, that, that the younger generation has a advantage of is they don't have, in this changing world, decades of experience that they have to shed to sometimes look at things from a fresh perspective. Consumer behavior is changing. People are used to buying on Zappos, Amazon, et cetera. That's impacting the way that we do business with our dentists, with, our, with the taxis, with, with, with every local company that there is, right? I have groceries delivered to my house twice a week. A truck pulls up and delivers fresh eggs, milk, the staples that my wife has. We get online and take care of it. That affects the local business. What's the experience that you're driving for? What are the processes that underpin that? Then you get to the structure. Structure is about taking the process, creating scale and sustainability. Those are the two core keywords there of structure. 
I want scale. I, want to, I might start small, but I'm going to grow it big. Look at our little Honda store. People, I get people all the time, they're like, Jared, you know all this digital marketing stuff. Why aren't you guys doing all sorts of marketing at your Honda store? Because we're brand new. And I practice what we preach. We're spending all of our money training our people. And when I feel like our people are perfected or perfected enough at delivering the experience, then we'll slowly start doing more and more marketing. But my goal is the experience. I don't care to tell a gazillion people to come down until I feel like I have all my employees prepped to handle them, right? Different way of thinking. Structure creates that scale so that I can, can do what we're doing on a small level at a bigger level, bigger level, bigger level, bigger, and that's how you grow it. Sometimes they grow really fast, sometimes they grow slower. That just depends on the business and the market. It's not necessarily a function of the business. You gotta make sure that the business is ready to grow as fast as the market will allow. And then last, you market to outcomes. You don't just buy paid search because the dude comes around and is like, you know, paid search is awesome and there's 100 billion people on Facebook, so spend some money there too. Like, hang on. Like, market for an outcome. No, very crystal clear. I, I had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with a bunch of young entrepreneurs in Salt Lake. They asked me to come and kind of do this, like, I don't know, mentor thing or whatever. And, and they were like, ah, oh, you know, Silicon Valley, all the VCs are telling me that I have to run my business this way. And I'm like, yeah, they all told me I had to run my business that same way too. And when they said I needed to go right, sometimes I went left. And when they said I needed to go up, sometimes I went down. There was nothing wrong with being entrepreneurial about being an entrepreneur, right? Don't get yourself stuck in these traps of I have to do what everyone else is. Know your outcome, be crystal clear on what the outcome is, and then chart your own path to it. That's what it means to be entrepreneurial. And every one of us can do that within the constraints of our brand and our business. Market to deliver outcomes. And my final thought, and then I'm done, because I'm 32 seconds over, is Peter Drucker. I love this, love this quote. Peter Drucker is considered the father of modern day management. He was a professor at Stanford University, passed away probably about a decade ago. Brilliant, brilliant man, thick German accent. He has this saying, he talked about calculated obsolescence. In a lot of businesses, this means, you know, factory, you're, you're calculating the obsolescence of your parts and your inventory and making sure that it turns quick enough. This has nothing to do with this. This has everything to do with your job and my job. And if I were to summarize in my own words, what it means is that you and me, we all have the same core underlying function of our job. We are in a free market, thanks, because we live in this wonderful country called the United States of America. And in those free markets, in every little community like Walla Walla around the country, we all have the same goal, and that is our job is to make ourselves obsolete. Because if we don't make ourselves obsolete, our competitor will. Thus, the only way of staying in the pole position is be you being the person to constantly reinvent yourself and staying ahead of the market. And with that, thank you all for your time. Jared is, is very fun. I mean, it's, it's so um, interesting how he can fit in about two and a half days with the material in about 45 minutes. So uh, <laughs> that was fabulous. Uh, one more time, Jared Hamilton.